Hi guys, good evening. Good evening to everybody. So I am Milan Govan, online exit.com man. Teaching personal courses knowledge. So we have come across so many things in the past 15 days back. So we are once again starting a new chapter, physiology. So normally in uh, that is uh, board education, that is Tamil Nadu board education, we have this physiology coming in the 12th standard. But as per the NEET syllabus, as per CBC syllabus, we have physiology coming in the 11th standard plus one syllabus. That is why you like to start as per the NEET syllabus or just the CBC syllabus or NCRT syllabus. Physiology. You know the study, what is physiology? That is the study of the functional aspects of different organs and organ systems as a general rule. The study of functions of organs and organ systems that is coming into physiology. We have a number of systems in uh, actually our anatomy. For example, the digestive system, circulatory system, and so on. And then this one we are talking about, we are studying something about the anatomy in the 11th standard or in just possibly year before in 10th standard, the internal organization. And now we are talking about the functional aspects of each and every organ system. And coming under this one, the first one, digestion and absorption. Nothing but just generally we can say the digestive system, what is its role in the life of an organism. Now what do you mean by digestion? So we are normally just uh, consuming the complex food materials. The complex food materials in the form of carbohydrates or in the form of proteins or in the form of fats or even we have some other materials. So all are found in complex form. But the body needs only just at the simplest forms of these complex food materials. Then only they can pass across the intestine to reach the various cells to get energy or to do other activities. And for that one, the complex materials should be broken into simpler forms that can be easily absorb and assimilate. And that process is called digestion. The breakdown or conversion of complex food materials, what we call is one as the biomolecules or biomacromolecules, because they are all larger in size. It is simple, absorbable substances that can be assimilated easily by the body. And that process is called what is known as digestion, brought about by the digestive system. So it is being done by both mechanical and chemical methods. So the breakdown being brought about both by mechanical as well as biochemical methods of uh, this actually the processes, biochemical methods. Now let's see what are the important components of the digestive system, the one which is badly needed by human body or any other animal body for breaking such complex materials into simpler forms. As a general rule in the case of vertebrates, that was the case of human beings. We have the digestive system being formed of two important components. A long tuber starting from mouth ending with anus, which is being actually specialized in certain regions in between anus and mouth. And the second one, the digestive glands, the one responsible for secreting certain chemical substances, what we call what we call them as enzymes or biocatalysts. And they are released by the digestive glands. These are the two major components or the parts of the digestive system. Now let's start with the elementary canal. We are starting something about this one in your other classes. So it is starting with mouth, ending with anus, and passing through different organs. For example, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, etc. And this is the general rule in the case of all the vertebrates. But the two in the case of human beings, it is highly specialized because we are reaching the utmost complexity when compared to other organisms. Now this is a picture showing the digestive system, it will pass on to that one, we will see later again. Now I am you know, I mentioned already, it includes, that is mouth, the buccal cavity also called as a oral cavity, then the throat otherwise called as a pharynx, then the food tube normally called as a esophagus, then the stomach, the place of digestion of some food materials, small intestine, then large intestine, the place of formation of feces or undigested waste along with actually other structures, mainly for sending out the waste called as the anus. Now let's start with the first part, the mouth or oral cavity or buccal cavity. See, actually, during embryonic development, 
So we have formed the mouth as well as the animals. So we are coming under what we call the deuterostomes. I mentioned earlier under the classification. Human beings are coming under deuterostomes. The meaning for that one, the anus is formed first and the mouth is formed at a later stage of development. That means during embryogenic, the blast of coal or the blast, the blast of coal or the gas to lung develops into anus or the anus is formed made by the blast of coal. Such organisms are called deuterostomes where anus is developed either from the blast of coal or nearby it and the mouth is formed at a later stage of development. That is why the name is given deuterostome. Now, the oral cavity of the buccal cavity. So, what are the components found in the buccal cavity and oral cavity? So, it is a place of mastication. It is a place of both mechanical as well as chemical digestion of food materials. It is a place of both mechanical as well as chemical digestion of food materials. The important components found in the mouth cavity mainly concerned with mechanical digestion are teeth and the tongue. These are the two structures concerned with the mechanical digestion. One more structure also releasing their secretions into the buccal cavity, namely the salivary glands, they are responsible for the chemical digestion. Now we will have something about the components involved in mechanical digestion, mainly concerned with the crushing of food or the mastication of food materials. Number one, teeth and another one, tongue. Now, about the teeth. So when we are talking about teeth, human teeth, it is normally described as thick or down. The meaning for that one, the teeth are placed in bony sockets or bony cavities. So that is why the teeth are described as the or down. Then diffuse down. During development, we have formed two different sets of teeth. The first set of teeth, what we call as the milk teeth, total number 20, and which is being replaced by a permanent teeth after six years of age. So we have the teeth formation between the age of six months to six years for milk teeth and later the milk teeth are replaced by permanent teeth. As we have developed two sets of teeth during development, human teeth are described as diffiodon, diffiodon. Then heterodon. So if we are taking each jaw, we can have four types of teeth. Cutting teeth, tearing teeth and grinding teeth group under two headings. For example, we have the incisors, we have the canines, the premolars and molars. That is why the type of teeth is called heterodon. The type of teeth in human beings is called heterodon. The meaning for that one, we have four different types of teeth. Unlike the shark. So in the case of shark, we have the teeth condition homodon because all the teeth are similar in size and shape also. Then, our teeth also described as bunodon. So what is the meaning for bunodon? If you are taking the grinding teeth, say an example of molar and premolars, you can find there are certain cavities. There are some grooves. These small shallow grooves actually can form. So these cavities found on the surface of the teeth are called cusps. They are called as cusps. So based on the nature of the cusp, we can have bunodon. The meaning for that one. The cusps are very shallow, not so deep. The cusps are very shallow and not so deep. That is why our teeth are described as pinodon. So, thicodon, placed in sockets, diffiodon, formation of two sets of teeth, heterodon, presence of four types of teeth, and bunodon, presence of shallow grooves on the surface of teeth, what we can call this one as cusp. Then, so we can represent the arrangement of teeth in the form of a formula what we call this one, the dental formula. See the arrangement of each two in each half of the upper and lower jaw. The arrangement of each two in each half of the upper and lower jaw, we can represent in the form of a dental formula. And further than making one thing, just so this is one half of upper jaw, let us assume. So there are totally 16 teeth in upper jaw as well as in lower jaw. So if you are taking each half of buffer, each half of jaw, each half of a jaw is a mirror image of another half. 
That is why we are representing the general formula by taking one half in the numerator and one half of the jar in the denominator in the general formula multiplied by two. See, if we are taking in such a manner, so each two in each half of the upper jar is represented in the orders of incisors, canine, premolars, and molars. And such a formula that is being represented is called as a general formula. The dental formula is not uniform for different animals. So, if we are taking the dental formula in the case of human beings, we are C on either side. So, we have two incisors and one canine, two premolars and three molars. So, we are taking each half only. So, we are representing two incisors, one canine. And then also just the two premolars and then premolars and then this is the numerator that represents the upper jaw, one half of the upper jaw, and then the denominator we have again one half of the lower jaw. So this is the dental formula, it is being multiplied by two so that we can get 32. Two, one, two, three, two for just incisors, one for canine. 2 for just negative premolars and 3 for molars and each half only. So that's why just by multiplying by 2, we are getting what is called 32 totally. So this is arranged as each half is a mirror image of another half. We are representing in that manner. So if you are taking, for example, the dental formula in the case of a um, same example of rat, the total number of just actually teeth in rat is about only 16. The total number of teeth in the case of a rat is 16, we are taking a rat. So what is the dental formula? So they have incisors 1, no canines, no premolars, then we have premolars 3, then 1, 0, 0, 3, multiplied by 2. So that is the total number in the case of rat, that is 16. Suppose we are taking rabbit rabbit. So in the case of rabbit, so we have just actually two zero that is two zero that is twenty-three. I am writing two zero two three. Sorry, I mean it's two zero actually um two zero two three sorry two zero three three this is in the upper chart. So in the case of rabbit, the total number of teeth is about 28. The total number of teeth 28, unlike other animals. The upper jaw has one set of one number of teeth. The lower jaw has one number of teeth. For example, 1, 0, 2, 8. See, 2 plus 3, 5 plus 3, 8. 2 into 8, 16 in the upper jaw. And 1, 2, 3. 3 plus 2 plus 1, 6. 2 into 6, 12. So the upper jaw has altogether 16 teeth, the lower jaw has only 12 teeth. So altogether we have 28 in the case of rabbit. Now here you can notice one thing. And even in the case of animals, which animal has large number of teeth? Which animal has large number of teeth? For example, in the case of horse. The horse total number of that is actually 44. The horse has a total number of 44. The most number of teeth found only in the case of horse. So they have, for example, 3, 1, 4, 3, then 3, 1, 4, 3, multiplied by 2. Okay, so 22 in the upper jaw and 22 in the lower jaw. So largest number of teeth we can see only in the case of horse. This is the dental formula for this horse. Three one four three three one four three. And in the case of human beings, you have two one two three, two one two three. Now, in the case of rat and rabbit, you could see just actually see this is the canine teeth. In the case of both rabbit as well as rat, the canine teeth are absent. There is a space between the grinding teeth and the incisors. That space normally found in the case of such animals is called diastema. 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 The space may be the incisors and then just the molar teeth, or simply we can say the grinding teeth, is called as diastema. 
there are no connective teeth in the case of rabbit rabbit that is being represented by left space and that is called as stem so these are some of the examples only you have know something about rat rabbit and also the case of horse then i mentioned already we have in the case of human beings we have two sets of teeth so in the permanent teeth formula you know that 1 2 1 2 3 2 1 2 3 Two incisors, one comma, two premolars and three molars, then multiplied by two, so you can get ultimately that is what we have the number of teeth thirty-two. Now, in the case of young ones, I mentioned already we have a set of teeth called as milk teeth. That's why I mentioned there are two sets of teeth during development in human being, milk teeth. So the number of milk teeth we have twenty. The number of milk teeth twenty. So, what is the formula? Two incisors, one canine, no premolars, two molars. Then in the lower jaw also the same number, two incisors, one canine, no premolars, then two molars. Then multiplied by two, you can get twenty. So the number of milk teeth is equal to twenty. The number of adult teeth is equal to just thirty-two. And which type of teeth absent in the case of milk teeth condition, or in the case of young ones or infants, the premolar teeth are not represent their absence. So these are some of the things related to the dental formula. So we are arranging the teeth in each half of the lower jaw and each half of the upper jaw in the form of a formula. That formula is called a dental formula. We'll go back to the structure on second. So the arrangement of each tooth in each half of the upper lower jaw in the order of incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, and that arrangement is called dental formula. The nature of the dental formula in the case of human being is represented as two one two three as numerator and two one two three as denominator representing each half of upper and lower jaw. Then, what is the nature of uh, the structure? If you are taking any tooth, either incisor or canine or premolar or molars, we can have three parts. The one which is exposed is called as a crown. A small part which is being eaten by the gum or gingiva is called as a crown. Sorry, what is called as a neck. And the lowermost part which is hidden just inside the cavity of bone is called as a root. So the visible part of crown. The neck is simply covered by actually the gum and gingiva, and then the root part, which is normally hidden, are simply concealed in the bony cavity. Now about the crown. So this is a visible part, and this visible part is normally protected by a transcellular cell, the hardest secretion, namely the enamel. So the crown part, which is normally covered. Protected by the translucent, a shiny, just the hardest secretion, namely the enamel. So, if you have one question just about which is the hardest secretion in the body, it is none other than what is called enamel. This answer came in the question paper also. So, the hardest secretion in the animal body, particularly the human body, is called enamel. Now, what is the name of the cell which secretes enamel? So, when you are losing this enamel, only you have the sensitiveness. On dental caries, all the other symptoms related to the tooth decay you have developed once you lost this enamel, a protective covering. All sorts of trouble you have developed in your teeth. Now, the enamel is secreted by the cells what are called the amyloblast. The enamel is secreted by cells what are called amyloblast. So, the enamel is normally made up of acellular material. It cannot be regenerated once it is being lost. So that's why I mentioned here it is not regenerable and acellular, not made up of cells. It is simply a coating. Once it is lost, it cannot be regenerated. That's why we have problems. Now, just below this enamel coating, we have the main structure of the tooth, the hardest part, namely the skeleton of tooth, that is formed of a substance what is called dentine. So the skeleton of tooth is made up of a substance called dentine. So unlike the enamel, the dentine is cellular and regenerative. So it is formed of cells and also it can be regenerated. So enamel cannot be regenerated and also it is acellular. And this one is actually cellular and regenerable. 
It is secreted by the cells what is called odontoblast. Odontoblast. The name of the cell which is secreted by is called odontoblast. The name of the cells which is secreted by enamel is called the ameloblast. Don't forget, ameloblasts are actually non living structures and they cannot be regenerated. Whereas the dendron is normally cellular, a living tissue, and normally it can be regenerated. Now, this is arrangement the arrangement of the teeth. Now, the structure of the tooth. I have taken first one the enamel, the second one dendron. So, the enamel, this is the outer coating, it is normally visible just with a crown feature. One question also came in the question paper, in which one of the following parts you have no enamel, where you have no enamel in the teeth, either in the crop or in the neck or in the root. So now when the answer is given, it is absent in the root, also in the neck region, but possibly it is completely absent in the root region. It is found mostly strictly to the surface of the teeth, particularly in the crown region. Then, so each tooth encloses a cavity, a living cavity consisting of blood vessels, the nerves, the lymphatic vessels, etc. That cavity is always called as the pulp cavity, also called as a root canal. Here I represented a tooth having two roots. So in the case of canine, you may have one or just possibly in the case of a canine teeth, you have only one root. In the case of molars or premolars, we have two roots. Now, the part which is hidden in the bony socket is called as a root. So, you see that one, this is a jaw bone in which one it is getting embedded, that is why it's called as a pico nerve. Now, the tooth in the root part is lined with a kind of substance. The name of the substance is called cementum or cement. The name of the substance lining, actually, the tooth is called cement or cementum. So, it is actually secreted by cementocytes, a type of living cells, cementocytes. Now, the cementum is externally lined with another ligament, what we call this one peridontal ligament. The peridontal ligament actually contains certain fibroblast cells. The cells secrete what we can, what we can say that is a fibers. The fibers are extending into the cementum on one side and also into the bone on another side into the cement of one side, that is actually the lining, into the bony socket on the side, by means of certain fibers. And such fibers are called sharp paste fibers. Sharp paste. Sharp paste fibers. S H A R P Y apostrophe S. Sharp paste fibers. They are nothing but actually fibers produced by the fibroblasts of the peridontal ligament or membrane, penetrating into the cementum on one side and penetrating into the bone on the side, and the other side, and that is why they are fixing the bone in the bony cavity. That is about what we have. So the pulp cavity is the living structure, what I mentioned, and normally it is not being infected. If infection happens, it has to be replaced. You know that one in the case of dental caries, first the enamel is affected. The next, that is what we have, the dendrite gets eroded and finally the pulp cavity also infected. In such cases, we need a treatment. That treatment is called the root canal treatment. We will be studying later about this one. So, we talked about the enamel, the dendrite and also the cementum. The diagram showing the structure of tooth. A little bit more I want to tell you about this one. So the root, the dendinum root is covered by cement, secreted by the cement of science, the living cells. And we have enclosed inside the, just a tooth, what we call this one, the pulp cavity, it contains blood vessels, the lymphatic vessels and also the nerves. So that is about actually the root, uh, sorry, about the tooth, what we are talking about. So I am giving only a brief structure, not an, an NJ, just a deep structure for tooth, it is not necessary, you have to know about the enamel about the dendrite, about the short base fibers, about the cementum, where you have the enamel is present, where it is absent, etc. Then, the next structure which is helping normally the mechanical digestion of the food is nothing but the tongue. You know that one, the tongue is a skeletal mass. The tongue is normally formed of a skeletal mass. Though it is not attached to the bones, it is a striated muscle. It is what we call this one a voluntary muscle. 
and such skeletal muscles which normally not attached to the bones are called intrinsic muscle so the term skeletal muscle is an example for intrinsic muscle we'll be studying later and our tissues and our histology we'll study in brief anyway the term is an example for intrinsic muscle though it is a skeletal muscle it is not attached to the bones it is simply attached to the floor of the buccal cavity by means of a fold the name of the fold actually used for attaching the thumb to the floor of the buccal cavity is called frenulum frenulum the name of the fold by which the thumb is connected to the buccal cavity is called frenulum now on the upper surface you know that when the thumb is is an organ of gustatory so it is the gustatory receptor it is a gustatory sense organ Though it is formed of muscles, on the surface we have certain epithelial cells. Sensory epithelial cells are accumulated together to form certain structures. What we call this one the projections, the papillae. So the papillae are nothing but the gustatory receptors formed by a combination of normal as well as sensory cells concerned with the perception of taste. So these projections are papillae. And each papilla is nothing but a collection of taste buds. The taste buds are only formed of sensory cells as well as what we call the supporting cells, together responsible for perceiving the taste. So, on the surface of the tongue, we have collection of taste buds in the form of projections called papillae. Normally, in the case of animals, where we are talking about mammals, or we are talking about mammals, there are four types of papillae. But in the case of human beings, we have only three types of family. What are they? So based on the shape, they are named as filiform, fungiform, as well as the circumvallate. Filiform family, fungiform family, and circum. The most abundant the fungiform. The most abundant fungiform. And the smallest one, filiform. The largest one and few in number, the circum. The abundant one fungiform, the smallest one filiform, and the largest one but few in number called circumvent. So it is the one which is arranged in the form of what we call this one inverted letter B. Inverted letter B towards the basal thing. Suppose we are taking the tongue. So this is actually the circumvent papilla. Larger few number. Arranged in the form of a letter B, inverted letter B, like that. And that is the nature of the papilla, the circumvallate, the largest fever number present towards the posterior end of the tongue. Now, one more type of papilla which is absent in man is found in rabbit. And that is what is called the foliate papilla. So, this is first. So, what is the type of papilla? Normally, absent in the case of human beings, we have a foliate papilla. Just like a leafy structure found in the case of rabbit, but apps. So we have three types of papillae, but actually, but we have different types of uh, that is four types of papillae in the case of rabbit. So we are not talking about actually histology. After finishing physiology, I already made that is actually the slide a topic for you, the histology in deep. We will talk about the types of epithelial cells, the muscle cells, the blood cells, the connective tissue, and other cells, the bone cells, cartilage, etc. We will come after finishing physiology. So don't worry about this one. So now in this form of epithelial cells are pavement epithelial cells, flattened cells, polygonal cells, found in places where you have the exchange of gases is possible, the filtration is taking place, and also where the cells are packed, where the body is exposed to friction. For example, the squamous epithelium found in the buccal cavity. The skin epidermis is found as squamous epithelial cells. Like that, we'll see later. Okay. Okay. Now coming back to this one. So pharynx, the next one, the oral cavity leads into the pharynx, otherwise called as a throat. And this is the place where you have the meeting of the respiratory as well as the foot passage. This is a common passage for foot as well as back, commonly called as a throat. Where only we have the starting point of the esophagus as well as that is the respiratory tube. Now, both the esophagus and trachea open into the pharynx, what I mentioned earlier. Now, in the trachea, you know that one the place where we are starting the trachea, 
the opening of the trachea that actually called the glottis. The opening of the trachea. Suppose it's a tracheal system is related into the respiratory system and we have the esophagus nearby. So it is found anteriorly, the esophagus is found posteriorly, you can see very easily. The first one what we are observing is nothing with the tracheal system or the respiratory system, just behind it what you have the foot tube. Now the trachea has a small slit and this slit is called the glottis. The opening of the trachea, we can see the opening of the larynx. Now this is the larynx part and this is the trachea part, the larynx is a voice box. And this opening can be closed or opened by means of a lid. The lid is called epiglottis. We'll talk about later about this one. Also in the case of tissues, epiglottis, a flap of elastic cartilage. The type of cartilage formed in epiglottis is nothing but elastic cartilage. That is the one which is used to close or open the glottis. At times of feeding, this is the lid which closes the glottis, preventing the entry of food into the trachea. So it is being kept open while we are talking or when we are giving actually some sound from the just mouth. At times or while we are speaking only it is being normally open. And while eating food, in order to prevent the entry of food, it is being closed by means of a lid made up of elastic cartilage, what is called epiglottis. So, the pharynx is the throat, where you have the common passage of the reserve. It's a common passage, we have the respiratory and then the fluid tubes meet. And then the opening of the larynx or the trachea, namely the glottis is being closed or opened by means of a cartilage flap. And that flap is nothing but epiglottis, made up of hyalids or elastic cartilage. So the opening of the pipe is another is called as the glottis. We'll study more about under the respiratory system. Now the next one is esophagus. So now the oral cavity leads to the pharynx from where it leads to the esophagus. The only place where there is no digestion occurs. The place where no digestion occurs is nothing but the esophagus. The total length of esophagus is about 20 cent 25 centimeter long. It is mainly made up of the smooth muscles and also the mucus line. The mucus line, the mucus line is also line. So normally through the alimentary canal, if you are taking the wall of the alimentary canal, it is being formed of four layers, still selected about this one. So anyway, the esophagus is a place meant for conducting the food from the mouth to the stomach, not meant for digestion. No digestion occurs in the esophagus. Now, at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach, at the junction of the esophagus and stomach. So what we call this one, this is the area, gastroesophageal sphincter, a type of smooth muscle which normally regulates the passage of substances from one organ to another or from the body to the outside and that is called as a sphincter muscle, a type of smooth muscle. The type of smooth muscle, a ring of muscle formed at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach to regulate the movement of food or the passage of food called as gastroesophageal sphincter. And that one regulates the opening of the esophagus into the stomach by regulating the passage of food substances. Then, about the stomach. So, normally the stomach is a J shaped organ, a bag like structure. The volume varies from one individual to another. It can accommodate nearly 1.5 to 2 liters, the total accommodation. So, it is being located normally on the left side the abdominal cavity, just below the diaphragm, not on the right side, right side we have the liver, on the left side only we have the stomach, the back located just below the diaphragm on the left side. Now it is being differentiated in the three parts. The part nearer to the entry of the esophagus, this is called the cardiac stomach. And this is the main body, just nearby we have the fontic stomach and later we have the pyloric stomach. So cardiac, fontic stomach and pyloric part. So these are all the three parts you have in the stomach in human body. The cardiac part, the fundic part and the pyloric part. And each part has its own function. Either secreting something or just normally concerned with storing like that. You will see it. Now the small intestine. So the total length, the total length of the small intestine is roughly about 6.25 meters. And it's divisible into three parts. One, the first part, more or less U-shaped, about 25 centimeter long, is called as a duodenum. 
So that is actually the first part, the duodenum, first part. See, and actually this is the first part, the duodenum. And it is followed by somewhat a long coil part, jejunum. This is the second part. And further followed by a highly coiled, more elongated structure, what is known as just actually ilium part. That is what is called the ilium, this part. Highly coiled. So the jejunum is somewhat long coiled, but not up to the level of this ilium. So you have the duodenum, the place of diet. Then ilium part, the place of absorption. If you are considering the main function, Duodenum is the place of digestion. And now this part is a place of a, what is called absorption. And jejunum somewhat helping for absorption as well as digestion. And it is followed by actually the large intestine. I'll come this back later. Now it is 6.25 meter long and it is related to just I mentioned the three parts. You have just actually the duodenum, which is about 25 centimeter long. And just a highly coiled ilium, which is much longer, roughly about 5.5 meter long. And then the long coiled ilium portion of the genome, roughly about just actually half a meter long. So the opening of the stomach in the duodenum, another sphincter muscle is present at the junction of the pyloric stomach, the narrow part of the stomach, and the duodenum. That region is called pylorus, a constricted region. There you have another sphincter muscle, as in the case of the junction of the esophagus and stomach. Here it is called pyloric sphincter, as it is located just in the pylorus reach, namely the pyloric stomach. So it is also a ring of muscle which regulates the flow of chyme. Chyme is nothing but actually a semi solid, partially digested food, a porridge like that is formed normally in the stomach. So it regulates the flow of chyme from the stomach into that is about the role of this sphincter muscle pyloric sphincter. Now, the wall of the small industry, the inner wall being raised into many finger like projections, namely the mucosal wall. If you are taking the wall of the industry or the interior canal, we have four layers outer serosal layer, then the muscular layer from outside to the interior, some mucosa and mucosa. Now, in the small industry, just actually the mucosal layer is thrown into many narrow tubular finger-like projections. And these narrow finger-like projections are the foldings or called as the layer. The main function is to increase the surface area of absorption. So in order to increase the surface area of absorption, they have folds that is not just actually the sorry, the small intestine has folds, and these folds are nothing but very light. The unit of absorption. The unit of absorption. Now, what is the peculiar character about actually the villi? The cells lining the villi are having rush border, having some small projections called as a microvilli. So, not only the entire villi, but also this microvilli, the projections, small projections in the form of cilia like structure, they are called together as the brush border. You will see in the picture later. And they are also responsible for increasing the surface area of absorption. That is why we have more surface area for absorption. And suppose you are taking the structure of a villus in a simple organization. Each villus is nothing but an absorption unit. Consisting of an outer epithelial layer having a brush border. Enclosing a network of blood capillaries formed by an artery and a vein. And in the middle, we have a small lymphatic vessel. That small lymphatic vessel is called lacteal vessel or lacteal duct. So you see in the picture now. So you see that one bunch of, uh, just I don't see, the, you cannot see actually the labelings. I want to show this one only how many villi you have in that, in that, that is small industry. We have many villi. We also have the natural photograph, I'll show it to you later. So, we have a number of villi actually thrown into folds from the inner wall of the industry and they are responsible for increasing the surface area of absorption. Now, let's see the structure in detail. Now, this is a single villus formed by an epithelium. You can see some hair like structures they represent the microbial. They increase the surface area of absorption. And now, in the wall of the industry, 
The epithelial cell also forms certain glands. What we call this one, the intestinal glands. Later, we'll see about their role, what they perform. They are secreting some enzymes together for the intestinal juice, playing a major role in digestion. So, you see the brush border. The brush border is actually because of the microbial life. And this is a single layer of epithelium, not many layer of epithelium, a single layer of epithelium, which enclosing what we have just received that one, the green one, normally called as the lymphatic vessel. Also, we have the nerve fiber. So, we have a lymphatic vessel, what we call this one, the lacteal vessel. So, an artery and a vein, and also a lymph duct. So, this is a lymph duct, and this one is what is called the lacteal vessel. So these are all the major, more or less somewhat large lymphatic vessel, an artery and a vein. And the capillaries of these veins and arteries in the lymphatic vessel together form a mass inside the villus, concerned with the absorption of certain materials. So anyway, the villus is normally lying in a single layer of epithelium. And you can see only in the villus the brush rod, concerned with just increasing the surface area absorption. Don't forget this one. So, where you come across the brush border, mainly the region of the small intestine, where you have more number of villi, particularly the ileum region. Now, the large intestine. So, if you are taking the large intestine, you can have just actually, it is formed of three major components. One, the colon, this part. Then, we have the rectum. Then, anus. Along with a structure, what is called the cecum. So, colon, rectum, cecum, along with anus, these are all the components. Now, the colon is actually formed of a different parts an ascending colon raising up, a transverse colon, then a descending part, and also skewed structures like sigmoid colon. So, ascending, transverse, descending, and also we have sigmoid colon. Now, the second structure related to the large industry, we have the cecum. It is a small blind end sac. A small blind end sac. Normally having certain symbiotic bacteria concerned with the fermentation process. Concerned with the fermentation process. A small blind sac that normally causes some active symbiotic microorganisms responsible for actually doing the process of breakdown. And even something also responsible for the release of the vitamin B complexes. Now, this is actually the part, the large industry, a small diagram. And this is the cecum part. And this is the anus. Now, this region, what I mentioned, is nothing but the cecum. And from the cecum, there arises a small tubular, narrow, finger like structure. And that structure is called the vermiform appendix. Where we form appendix. So it is a vestigial organ not doing any functions. We know the meaning of vestigial organ, an organ which was functional in the past in our ancestors, but at present non-functional. And such one is called actually a vestigial organ. We have a number of vestigial organs in our body, mainly about 180 vestigial organs. That's why we have a nickname. We are all called moving museum of antiquities. Moving museum of antiquities. Because we have a number of non-functional organs that was recorded by one person also with a sheep. So, the vermiform appendix is nothing but a tubular, narrow, finger-like structure arising from the blind and the sac, what we call this one, the sea. Now, this is the place where the small industry joins with this large industry. At that junction, we have a small wall, what is called ileocecal wall. And what is the role of this ileocecal wall? And that one prevents the backward flow of the feces into the small industry. Prevents the backward flow of undigested waste into the small industry. That is the role of ileocecal wall. And now, just actually, the large industry in the colon is followed by the rectum. The rectum opens outside to anus. It is also having a ring of muscles, what is called the anus finger muscles, which regulate the passage of waste from the body to the exterior. Then, so I mentioned about the different parts of uh, the structures. Now, there is one component related to the costume and its point of view. If you are taking the inner wall of the colon, the inner wall of the colon has some longitudinal muscular bands. 
some longitudinal muscular bands extending the whole length of the body, and they are called tinea coli. They are called tinea coli or tinea coli, the plural form tinea coli. So when these long muscles are contracting, we have received some pouches. Some pouch-like structures develop inside the colon, and such pouches are called hostra. Such pouches are called hostra. So the word tinea coli refers to nothing but the longitudinal bands of muscles present in the colon region. When they are contracting, some pouches, small bag-like structures develop. They are together called as hostra. Together called as hostra. Then the next part, recta. The descending part, namely, the colon enters into the rectum, which opens to the anus. I mentioned earlier. Then the large intestine, what is its role? Whether it is concerned with any digestion. So, as I mentioned earlier, in the case of esophagus, it is only a conduction tube, not concerned with any process of diet. And similar is the case in large intestine also. It is meant for only the storing of waste materials, mainly concerned with the absorption of water and some minerals, particularly sodium, and also for the formation of feces. So, the Actually, the solidification of the waste occurs by means of water reabsorption. Most of the water is reabsorbed, and some of the minerals also being reabsorbed, and that is the place of formation of pieces and not concerned with the process of digestion. Now, let us take the anatomy or the histology of the wall of the alimentary canal. Throughout the entire alimentary canal, starting from just anterior the esophagus up to the rectum, the wall is formed of four layers, outer wall from outside to the interior, outer, the second, the third and the fourth. Now what are the different layers? Now, let will show the picture. Now here is a cross section of a, a small industry, now it's simply the alimentary canal. You can see there are four layers, you can see there are four layers. The outermost layer is called the serosa layer. This serosa layer is actually formed of some connective tissue and also some epithelial cells, particularly. But normally we are talking about it is being formed of mainly some connective tissues, outer serosa layer. Then the next one we have the muscularis, the muscularis. So here the muscle layer formed of smooth muscles. They are arranged in two different types of muscles. One is longitudinal muscles and then another circular muscle. The longitudinal muscle is extending from end to end. The circular muscles are found in the front of brains. So we have outer longitudinal muscles and inner circular muscles. The muscle layers, the muscularis layer, found in two layers or in two forms or two components. The outer layer is formed of longitudinal muscles, the inner one is formed of circular muscles. Then the circular goes. Now it is a place where we have only the loose connection. Here we have the fibrous connective tissue. The serosa layer is actually from the fibrous connective tissue. But in the case of submucosa, that is a place where you have loose connective tissue, not dense fibrous connective tissue. So, because this is the area where you have the blood vessels, the lymphatic vessels, the nerves, and almost other glands are formed in the submucosa area. And that is why it is called actually a place of secretion. A place of actually accommodation for the blood vessels, for the lymphatic system, for the nerves, and also for the other structures, namely the glands. Then it is followed by the innermost layer, mucosa layer. So normally the mucosa layer is formed of connective tissue, some muscles, and the innermost layer of columnar epithelia. So it is a complicated structure having just what is called some muscles, then we have a loose connective tissue, what is called lamina propria, the name of the loose connective tissue. Normally when you are talking about lamina propria, so when you are talking about mucosa, the epithelium plus lamina propria together cause what is known as a mucosa layer, lamina propria. Lamina propria. So both the epithelial cells, the lamina propria, nothing but a form of loose connective tissue, the moist layer, together comes with the mucus, and some, some just actually muscle layers also form in this one. 
concerned with the production of mucus, concerned with the production of the enzymes or any other secretions. Now, a note about the digestive tracts. So, we talked about mainly the element you know, the nature of anatomy and the different components, what is the role in digestion. Now, the digestive glands. So, we need mainly the glands. These are all the exocrine glands. You know that not any glands which pour their secretions through their duct are called exocrine glands, excepting the pancreas, which is acting both exocrine as well as endocrine. So normally the digestive glands are concerned with the secretion of enzymes and also some other secretions to neutralize the acidity to make the element ethanol in alkali medium. So we will see later. So anyway the digestive glands, we have the salivary glands, the liver, the pancreas and also investment glands all are taking part in producing some secretions all as enzymes concerned with the digestion of the food materials at different levels. Now let's take the first one. Salivary glands. Say you have salivary glands. In human body, in the buccal cavity, there are three paths of salivary glands, unlike the rabbit. In the case of rabbit, we have four paths of salivary glands, and one pair is missing here. So the three paths of salivary glands in man are the parotis, the sublingual, or before that we know submaxillary, submandibular, and sublingual. The fourth one which is absent but found in rabbit is called infraorbital. The fourth one which is absent in man but present in rabbit is infraorbital. The just present below the orbit. You will see in the next slide. So there are three paths now in man, the parotid. So each gland opens with the buccal cavity by means of a specific salivary duct. The salivary ducts are named after the persons who have formed the ducts. Now, the parotid. Of all the three glands, the largest gland is nothing but the parotid gland. It is normally found in the cheek region, somewhere here, the temporal region or in the cheek region. And the name of the duct through which normally the saliva is transported to the buccal cavity is called the Stenson's duct. So, the name of the duct, the salivary duct, connecting the parotid salivary gland to the digestive cavity, the oral cavity is Stenson's duct. The second one, submaxillary, also called submandibular. Some of it is given submaxillary and some of it is given submandibular. It is found in the angle of the jaw. It is found in the angle of the jaw. The name of the duct, the secretion is poured into the buccal cavity, is called the Wharton's duct. After the name of the scientist, Wharton's duct, the salivary duct name. And now the third one, the sublinguals, normally found below the tongue. That's why the name is called sublingual because another name for tongue is lingua. Lingua. That's why it's called sublingua, which is normally the smallest one. The name of the duct is called duct of Rivenus or the duct of Bartholin. So Bartholin is duct or duct of Rivenus. That is the name of the salivary duct. And now the fourth one I mentioned earlier, infraorbitals. The one which is found just below the orbit, found in the case of rabbit but absent in the case of human beings. So remember this is one question in man. The one which is absent is nothing but infraorbital salivary gland, but found in the case of rabbit. Now, what is the role of this salivary gland? These glands secrete a fluid, what is called a saliva, into the buccal cavity. And that is meant for, actually, we will see the role of a uh, digestive role of this one later. And now, normally, the saliva is hypotonic. Hypertonic. It's not hypertonic, it is a hypertonic solution. And it is being secreted continuously or seeing the food or smelling the food or simply just by means of autonomous nervous system. So it is under the control of sympathetic or autonomous nervous system. And on seeing the food or simply just smelling the food or we are having the food in the mouth cavity, ultimately, automatically the secretion is normally done by the salivary glands or by the mouth cavity. So it is an involuntary process. The salivary secretion is a reflex activity. The secretion of saliva is a reflex activity because it is being secreted spontaneously without your will. On seeing the food, automatically it is being secreted. So that is why it is under the control of autonomous nervous system. Any reflex activity is always under the control of autonomous nervous system. So it is hypertonic. Then what about the functions? What are the general functions concerned with the taking enough food? What is called ingestion, digestion 
and it contains one antibacterial substance, what we call this one lysozyme. It takes part in immunity. It is an antibacterial agent killing the bacteria that enters into the mouth cavity along with the food or while bringing water any the solutions. So it is containing one type of antibody client concentration, IgA antibody, IgA. So the IgA antibody is the most abundant antibody, the lysozyme. It is coming into the first line of defense, protecting the body against the invading microorganisms. And another function of the saliva lubrication, because it is viscous, contains a substance, what is called mucin, a glycoprotein. That one just making all the food particles sticking together, are responsible for speech also, and also for swallowing, and then the lubrication of food. These are all the common functions, digestion, immunization, just what we have with antibacterial activity, then also speech. If your mouth is dry, it cannot talk. It. For example, once you are frightened, there is no secretion of the saliva. This is because it has been inhibited, the saliva secretion, the dryness of the mouth cavity making you not to deliver any speech. So the lubrication of food and speech, all the common functions performed by the saliva. Now the second gland, liver. So its size is normally equal to the size of the brain, the largest gland in the body. Weighing about, you see that one more or less equal to the weight of the brain. That is 1.2 to 1.5 kilograms. That is, unlike the stomach, it is localized on the right side. So left side you have the stomach, and right side you have the liver being formed just below the diaphragm. On the right side, made up of two lobes, right and left lobes. What are the components of the liver? So the liver is actually formed of liver cells, what are called the hepatocytes. And these hepatocytes are actually together constitute the unit of liver, the hepatic lobules. So we can go in this plan. The liver is formed of the structural function liver is called the hepatic lobules. And these hepatic lobules are made up of cells what are called the hepatocytes or hepatic cells. Now, and actually the cells are in the form of long cords. The long cords are actually the hepatic cells. So hepatic cells make up the hepatic lobules which represent the unit and function of what is called the liver. And if you are taking just one question related to the evidence point of view, taking the question level also. And if you are taking each hepatic lobule, each lobule is ensheathed or surrounded or enveloped or encapsulated by a fibrous connective tissue. And that is what is called the Gleason's capsule. Where you come across Gleason's capsule in the liver. It is nothing but a fibrous connective tissue layer covering the unit of liver, namely the hepatic lobules, glycine caps. So, the name of the fluid secreted by the liver is called the bile. So, the bile which is secreted by the hepatic cells normally pass through the hepatic ducts and is stored in a bagged structure in the liver, what is called as a gallbladder. In the gallbladder, normally what is happening, the bile is concentrated. The bile is concentrated. So the storage place of bile secreted by the hepatic cells carried by the hepatic duct is nothing but just a gallbladder. So normally from the liver cells, a duct arises, a many ducts, many ducts arise, what we call the hepatic duct. And from the gallbladder, there arises one duct, what is called as a cystic duct. The cystic duct from the gallbladder and the hepatic ducts from the hepatic cells or from the hepatic globules together join to form a common bile duct. So the bile duct is formed by the union of a cystic duct from the gallbladder and many hepatic ducts from the liver lobules. Then, normally the bile duct proceeds and opens into the duodenum. And before it is opening to the duodenum, it receives a duct from the pancreas. So now the pancreatic duct and the hepatic duct join together to form a common duct, and that is called hepatopancreatic duct. Hepatopancreatic duct. And before opening into the duodenum, the duct being swollen like this. This is actually a swollen part. And this swollen part of the hepatopancreatic duct, before opening into the duodenum, now this is a place of opening into the duodenum. This swollen part, which is formed by the hepatopancreatic duct, is called ampullae of weight or ampulla of weight, singular ampulla of weight, after the name of the person. 
Now, it opens into the duodenum. At the point of opening, there is a sphincter mass that was reported by OD. That one is called the sphincter of OD. Sphincter of OD, the name of the course. So, it is nothing but a circular ring of muscles present at the opening of hepatopangrelate that regulates the flow by into the duodenum. And before it is being discharged into the duodenum, the two ducts join together to form a common duct which becomes swollen and that structure is called ampulla of rat. So, remember that one, that just from the sphincter of OD, ampulla of rat, and also something about Actually, one more structure we'll see tomorrow has something about another structure or I mentioned earlier, the glycens capsule. So, glycens capsule, ampulla vat, and sphincter of body, these are all some of the structures related to the liver. So, I completed somehow, I not it completed about the liver fully. We had to go through also the pancreas. We'll see in the next class. So, you're most welcome to ask any questions. Anyway, it is a new topic, it is only under 12th standard in. That is in our uh, board examination, but it is coming under 11th standard in uh, just the need syllabus or CDC and NCRT syllabus. So it is new to you, those are actually studying in plus one board syllabus. So try to understand, and if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask any questions. Okay, thank you. The class is complete.